Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Mittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh. So when you begin to unpack this book right from the beginning and as God seems to call Jonah to go and give his message to the people at Nineveh, there is no conversation that happens between Jonah and God about the message that's supposed to be carried. We have Jonah who just hears what God is asking him to do and turns in the exact opposite direction and hightails it out of there. It's not unusual for prophets to have a little tug of war with God when he's asking them to deliver a message. For we have, uh, for instance, the the prophet Jeremiah who says to God when God asks him to go and deliver a message, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak for I am only a boy. Or perhaps Moses who states, Who am I? to go to the great Pharaoh of Egypt in order to rescue the Israelites. Jonah says nothing. He just makes a beeline for the opposite direction. He doesn't bother with excuses, a conversation with God. He goes to Tarshish to board a ship and get as far away from God as possible. And once he boards that ship, as we heard in the story this morning, God then raises up the waves and it becomes this turbulent situation. And while they're all running around trying to work out how to get out of this mess, the scripture tells us that Jonah was asleep in the bowel of the boat, curled up on a cushion. That should ring a bell for those who remember the storm that Jesus was in, in the boat. So there he is, in the boat, not worried about what is happening. They wake him up frantically, asking him, is it you? He confesses, yes, it is me. God is angry because I haven't done what he's asked me to. How do we stop it? Well, you throw me overboard. Shame those other passengers and those crew members. They try everything because I think they feel sorry for Jonah. They don't really want to throw him overboard because they know he's not going to survive. But the storm just seems to get worse. So they do, to save their own lives. And then God, the same God who raised up those waves, sends this gigantic fish not to eat him, to digest him, but just to keep him in this place, in the dark, with all that fishy smell, I'm sure. And one of the commentators says, it's as if God puts Jonah in a time out. You know, like when we put our children on the growing good chair or the naughty step, where they they just need time to think about their actions and what's going on in order to come to their senses. And so Jonah does. He comes to his senses. He prays to God. He confesses his sin. And he agrees to go and deliver the message to Nineveh. And so the fish spits him out and he makes his way. The scripture tells us that Nineveh is a huge city. It's a great city. In fact, it's got 120,000 people living in that city, which is a lot for the ancient world. Furthermore, it tells us that the length of the city is a three-day walk from one side to the other. And so Jonah begins his journey from one side. He does one day. And in that one day, while he's calling the Ninevites to repent of their ways and to heed God's calling, the message 
spreads to the entire city in one day. That even the king hears about, about Jonah's declaration, his message, that he tells and instructs the people to declare a fast and that they should all put sackcloths on and ashes on their head, even the animals. Can you picture it? I mean, it's one thing to imagine that people are in sackcloth with ashes on their head, but can you imagine the goats and the sheep and the hens and the, I mean, it's a joke. And can you imagine, because remember, even though Jonah has decided that he's going to follow what God's asking him because he almost has no choice, can you imagine how he proclaimed that repent and hear the good news and turn to God? I don't think he went, repent, people, return and be to God, otherwise God is going to destroy you. I think he walked around the city going, come guys, you need to repent. Guys, repent. Because he actually didn't have it in his heart for them to repent. It's ironic. Because God could have easily smited Jonah right at the beginning when he disobeyed him. He could have just said, waves engulf him, drown him, I'm done with him. I'll find somebody else who will deliver my message. Yet God persists with Jonah, constantly walking with him along the road of trying to get him to conform to God's ways, to repent of his own thoughts and actions. Jonah is receiving grace in each of these steps. It is only grace that is keeping him alive. And yet, he still wants to control God's grace for everybody else. 